Welcome to the Pediatric Review, where I help you prepare for your pediatric nursing exams. If you would like a copy of the study guide, you can find it on my website, blossomwithjessica.com. So let's talk about pediatric gastrointestinal disorders. So the first we have vomiting. The main things for this is it can lead to dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, metabolic alkalosis, aspiration, and pneumonia. Projectile vomiting can be a sign of pyloric stenosis or increased intracranial pressure. Our nursing interventions are always our ABCs, so maintain a patent airway, position the child on, the, on their side to prevent aspiration, monitor the amount, frequency, and characteristics of the vomit, their intake and output, and any signs of dehydration, oral hydration or IV hydration, antiemetics, assess for abdominal pain or diarrhea. Then we have diarrhea. So this is important because it can lead to dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, and metabolic acidosis. So take note, diarrhea is acidosis. And we remember that vomiting is metabolic alkalosis. Nursing interventions, we're looking at the characteristics of the stool, presence of pain, signs of dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, or that metabolic acidosis, monitor for skin integrity, strict INOs, and severe cases, the patient may need to be NPO with fluid IV hydrate. Then we have constipation, and our nursing interventions for this are high fiber and fluid intake. They may also need an enema, stool softener, or laxative as needed. Then we have a cleft lip palate or palate. This is a congenital abnormality due to the failure of the soft tissue or bone to fuse. Cleft lip repair happens at three to six months and cleft palate repair is at six to 24 months. This can lead to speech impairment and otitis media. Our nursing interventions are to assess the ability to suck, swallow, and breathe monitor fluid intake, calorie intake, and daily weights, hold the infant upright and direct milk to the side and back of the mouth when feeding, provide feeds in small amounts and burp frequently, suction equipment and bulb syringe at the bedside, and teach the patient ER feeding, so enlarged nipple, stimulate sucking reflex, swallow, and rest. Post-op, after a cleft lip repair, we want to provide lip protection, avoid positioning the child on the side of the repair or in a prone position, keep the surgical site clean and dry, and apply antibiotic ointment, monitor for signs of an infection. Post-op, for a cleft palate repair, we resume feedings. Oral packing may be secured to the palate. We usually remove this in two to three days. Do not allow the child to brush their teeth. Soft elbow or jacket restraints may be needed, but they have to be removed every two hours. And do not place objects like a tongue depressor or a thermometer in the patient's mouth and provide analgesics for pain. Now we're gonna talk about esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula. So these are congenital defects. The esophagus terminates before it reaches the stomach. This causes foods and fluid to enter the lungs or air enters the stomach. Signs and symptoms are the three C's, so coughing, choking, and cyanosis. They'll have frothy saliva, vomiting, abdominal distension, and regurgitation, and respiratory distress during and after feeding. Pre-op, they'll be NPO, have IV fluids, suction as needed, and supine upright position. Post-op, we maintain lines, tubes, and IV, and administer oral oral feedings with sterile water and frequent small meals. Then we have GERD. So this is the backflow of gastric contents into the esophagus. Most infants with mild GERD will improve in a year. Signs and symptoms are passive regurgitation or emesis, poor weight gain, irritability, hemotemesis or heartburn, and anemia. Nursing interventions are to assess breath sounds before and after feedings in relationship of vomiting and feedings or activity, assess for signs of aspiration, place suction equipment at bedside, monitor for signs of dehydration, intake and output, monitor IV fluids if prescribed, place infant in supine position for sleep, prone position when awake and being monitored, provide small frequent feedings, formula may be thickened with rice cereal, 
We can cross cut the nipple, burp the infant frequently and handle minimally after feedings, and for toddlers, feed solid foods first, then liquids. Complications of GERD include esophagitis, esophageal strictures, aspiration of gastric contents, and aspiration pneumonia. Then we have lactose intolerance. So this is the inability to tolerate lactose due to a deficiency of the lactase enzyme. Signs and symptoms, when milk is ingested, they'll have abdominal distension, cramps or colic, diarrhea, and gas. And our nursing interventions are to eliminate dairy products or administer an enzyme replacement. And they can develop a vitamin D or calcium deficiency, so we should provide a supplement and teach parents. Then we have hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So this is a narrowing of the pyloric canal between the stomach and duodendum. Signs and symptoms are projectile vomiting, hunger, irritability, peristalsic waves that are visible from left to right during feedings. So I'm underlining the ones that are important. An olive-shaped mass in the epigastrum just right of the umbilicus and metabolic alkalosis, electrolyte imbalance, and dehydration. So our I's and O's are to, so our nursing interventions are to monitor I's and O's, vomiting, episodes, stools, weights, dehydration, and electrolyte imbalance. They may have a pylor autonomy, which is an incision of the fibers of the pylorus. And pre-op, we monitor hydration, weights, I and O, urine specific, the number and characteristics of stool, correct fluid and electrolyte imbalance, and they may be NPO. And post-op, we're going to monitor I and O's, surgical wounds, and for abdominal distension, small frequent feedings, and gradually increasing and burp, burping frequently. Then we have celiac disease. So this is an intolerance to gluten, which is found in wheat, barley, rye, and oats. Onset is usually one to five years old, and it occurs three to six months after the introduction of gluten. We'll see diarrhea, vomiting, stetoria, anorexia, abdominal pain and distension, muscle wasting, particularly in the buttocks and extremities, anemia, irritability. We can also have a celiac crisis, so this occurs due to the consumption of gluten. They'll have vomiting and diarrhea, rapid dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, and severe acidosis. Nursing interventions, they should be on a gluten-free diet. Educate on lifelong elimination of gluten foods, vitamin and mineral supplements. Next, we have appendicitis. So this is inflammation of the appendix. Perforation may occur in a matter of hours. Signs and symptoms are pain in the periambicular area that radiate, radiates to the right lower quadrant. That's a key sign. Abdominal pain is most intense at McBurry's point. So if you see something with McBurry's point, think appendicitis. And re referred pain indicating the presence of peritoneal irritation. Rebound tenderness and abdominal rigidity, elevated white blood cells, side-lying position with abdominal guarding to relieve pain, difficulty walking and pain in the right hip, low-grade fever, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Then they can have peritonitis, which results from a peripherated appendix. That You'll see increased fever, abdominal distension, tachycardia, tachypnea, pallor, chills, restlessness, or irritability. It's important to note that signs of a peripherated appendix, sudden relief of pain, and then an increase in pain with right abdominal guarding. Hirschsprung's disease. This is a congenital abnormality with the absence of ganglion cells in the rectum, mechanical obstruction from low motility. Signs and symptoms are no meconium when they're born, refusing to suck, abdominal distension, delayed growth, vomiting, constipation, ribbon-like foul-smelling stools. This is a key sign. Nursing interventions, we want to monitor for Enterocolitis, so this will be fever, GI bleeding, diarrhea. We want to give them a low fiber, high cal, high protein diet with stool softeners, and they may need rectal irrigations. Pre op, they'll be NPO, we'll monitor weights, assess bowel function, fluid balance, IV fluids may be needed, antibiotics and colon irrigation, strict INOs, measure abdominal girth daily, and do not take rectal temperatures. Post-op will take vital signs with still no rectal temperatures, 
assess surgical site for redness, assess abdominal girth, assess stoma if present, assess anal area for stool, redness, or discharge, NPO status until bowel sounds return, and the NG tube to allow intermittent suction, IV fluids, intake and output, and daily weights. Then we have interception. This is telescoping of one portion of the bowels into another. Signs and symptoms are abdominal pain, knees to abdomen, vomiting up bile stained emesis, current like jelly stools. That is a key sign if you see that in a question. Distended abdomen with sausage shaped mass in right upper quadrant. Nursing interventions are to monitor for perforation, which will be fever, tachycardia, respiratory distress, and changes in level of consciousness. We give antibiotics, IV fluids, and an NG tube for decompression. If passage of normal brown stool occurs, interception has resolved, and prepare for hydrostatic reduction as prescribed, so pressure from air or fluid is used to exert pressure on the area involved, helping to re solve the prolapse. Then we have abdominal wall defects. So we have a few different types. types. So one is called filocele. So this is a herniation of abdominal contents through the umbilicus ring covered by a translucent sac. Nursing interventions include immediately after birth, it's covered with a sterile gauze soaked in normal saline to prevent drying, then wrapped with a layer of plastic wrap. We monitor vital signs every two to four hours, pre-op their NPO, IV fluids, and monitor for signs of infection. And post-op, we want to control pain, monitor infection or electrolyte imbalance, and ensure adequate nutrition. Then we have a gastro, this is a herniation of the intestines, is lateral to the umbilical ring, no membrane. So nursing interventions are exposed bowel is covered loosely in a saline soaked pad and the abdomen is loosely wrapped in plastic. Pre-op their NPO, IV fluids, and monitor for signs of infection. And post-op most infants develop prolonged ileus and require mechanical ventilation and parental nutrition. Then we have an umbilical hernia. This is when the bowel protrudes through the opening in the abdomen wall. There's a few different types. So we have an inguinal hernia, which is painless swelling that is reducible. Incarcerated hernia, this is a medical emergency due to compromising blood supply requires surgical repair. Non-communicating hydrocele, this is residual peritoneal fluid is trapped and it usually resolves by one year old, one years old and communicating hydrocele. So this is associated with a hernia and remains open from the scrotum to the abdominal cavity. Our nursing interventions include post-op for hernias, monitor vital signs, INOs, assess wounds, infections, redness, or drainage, and post-op for hydrocele or provide ice bags and scrotal support, instruct patients to avoid tub bathing until incision has healed, and avoid physical activity. And we have irritable bowel syndrome. So this is different than irritable bowel disease. Irritable bowel disease is an autoimmune condition which consists of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. We'll talk about that next. But before that, we'll talk about irritable bowel syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome is a self-limiting and will resolve due to it's due to increased motility. It's usually because of different foods that people eat that kind of upset their stomach. Signs and symptoms are diffuse abdominal pain unrelated to meals or activities, alternating constipation and diarrhea with the presence of undigested food and mucus, and nursing interventions are anticholinergic and moderate fiber, low fat, and a balanced diet. Inflammatory bowel disease. So this is not to be confused. So this is not irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. So this is not that, okay? These are two different things. IBS is like a food intolerance, more that situation. Inflammatory bowel disease is an autoimmune condition. So the body is fighting the intestinal tract. We have two types, ulcerative colitis and we have Crohn's. 
So ulcerative colitis is the chronic inflammation leading to poor absorption of nutrients. It begins in the rectum and spreads upward. The colon becomes edematous and has these bleeding lesions form on the mucous membranes. So scar tissue causes diminished absorption of nutrients. There'll be periods of exacerbations and remissions like any real autoimmune disease. So symptoms, anorexia, malice, frequent bloody diarrhea and mucus, abdominal pain, fever, fatigue, weight loss. The thing to know for ulcerative colitis is this is only affecting the very first lining of the mucous membrane of the intestine. So it's only affecting that outside lining and they get ulcers on this lining and that's what's creating the blood in the mucus. So our nursing interventions in an acute phase, they may be NPO, need an IV or parenteal nutrition. We restrict their activity to reduce intestinal activity. We monitor stool color, consistency, and for any signs of blood, monitor for hemorrhaging, perforation, or peritonitis. They may be on a low fiber diet during an exacerbation. They wanna avoid alcohol, caffeine, raw fruits, raw vegetables, whole wheat, and milk. These patients may need surgery to create a stoma. The stoma should be pink. If it's purple or black in color, this indicates compromised circulation. When it comes to Crohn's, this inflammation can occur anywhere in the GI tract. For Crohn's, how we talked about with ulcerative colitis is just the outside line, lining. Crohn's can go all the way through. These ulcerations, it can create fistulas because it can be the entire membrane of the intestines. We can see it leads to thickening and scarring, a narrowed lumen, fistulas, ulcerations, and abscess. Again, remissions and exacerbations. We can see things like fever, cramping after meals, weight loss, dehydration, abdominal distension, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, anemia. And our nursing interventions are during acute episode, it's the same as ulcerative colitis. And again, surgery may be necessary, but is avoided as long as possible because recurrence of the disease in the same region is likely to occur. If you would like a copy of the study guide, you can find it on my website, blossomwithjessica.com.